This video is a continuation of our debunking diet myths video, where we will be going more in depth about evidence-based methods, a term we mentioned last time. We will explain what evidence is and what good evidence consists of. To do this, we will take you through the parts of a research paper, also referred to as a scientific or academic journal article. We want to break it down for you because we know these papers can be pretty intimidating at first when you're not used to them. Even when you are familiar with reading them, the terminology and language that is used is very specific and often hard to decipher. We will also talk about how the media interprets these scientific papers in ways that are often inaccurate. We want to caution you about what the media presents and encourage you to judge the evidence for yourself. So let's get started. Every academic journal article begins with an abstract. This is the section of the paper that is often most read as a standalone entity for the paper itself. The abstract introduces the topic, summarizes the major findings, and states the conclusions made from the research conducted. The abstract is generally no longer than a paragraph, which reiterates the paper's purpose, and it gives the audience a concise summary of what is presented in the paper. Following the abstract is the introduction. This is an important section within an academic journal article because it is the part of the paper that is required to grab the attention of the reader. The introduction provides a grand overview of what the article is about and most often an explanation as to why it was important to conduct the research presented in the paper. Researchers generally indicate the focus of the paper and provides relevant information pertaining to the concepts that will be presented for further clarification. As the title suggests, the materials and methods section is a process by which the authors conducted their study. This can include the materials they used and the amount as well as time points of when they used their materials. They also include how they obtained these materials, any tests that were conducted and their reasoning for using these tests, and how they were going to present and analyze their data to make their conclusions. The authors can choose to also present this data in tables and charts to make things easier to understand for the reader. This section should also allow researchers to follow along and be able to repeat the experiments that were mentioned in the paper. The results section contains most of the experimental data in a logical order. The experiments performed should make sense with respect to the goals of the study. In order to fully understand the results section, one must spend ample time interpreting the graphs, tables, and pictures. The figures, tables, legends, and any other data should be presented in a clear and concise manner. It is also important to make sure that the statistical analyses that were used were appropriate for the type of data that was collected. The discussion section is where the authors report the analyses of their study results. This may include their opinions on the results, how the results compare to already published papers, limitations of their study, the real-life applicability of the results in terms of next steps, and further questions that the authors suggest. The acknowledgement section is also important because it allows the authors to have an opportunity to thank those who were involved in the study. It can also occasionally give clues to hidden biases, such as where sources of funding are coming from. The last thing that is usually presented in a paper is the reference section. This is where research articles from outside sources are cited. Unfortunately, this section of the report is rarely assessed critically. A good reference section should generally use more research papers and a variety of different sources. There may be exceptions to this rule, as some studies may be presenting data that is extremely novel and there may be very little research already published on it. Also consider how often authors cite themselves and ask yourself if there was a good reason to do so. Now we will look at an example of misinterpretation by media reports written in reference to scientific journal articles. Recently, researchers talk about a metabolic pathway that results in the production of hydrogen sulfide gas, which in small doses can prove to be protective for the cell. However, a popular media report uses information to interpret these findings that hydrogen sulfide, which is a component of human flatulence also known as farts, can be a cure for cancer. This demonstrates how certain media articles can generalize complex scientific information, which results in greater misinterpretation by the public. This is a very big problem in knowledge translation. Instead of presenting readers with the research findings conducted, some media reports focus on catchy headlines and broad generalizations to gain a greater audience for their publications. It is important to critically think about the information that is being presented outside of scientific articles because the data can be subjected to misinterpretation. Something to keep in mind is that no paper will be st structured the same way. For example, some may be missing an abstract or only have a discussion section and not a conclusion. Some papers will be of better quality than others, and there are also many types of research papers and many different types of studies which will affect how they report their data. 
We've only covered the most basic aspects of academic papers in this video. If you would like more information, we suggest visiting these following resources. We also caution you about making conclusions on only one published paper. The experiment or study needs to be repeated by researchers and scientists to ensure that the results are consistent. You may want to look for review articles such as systematic review studies that compile many individual studies and critically evaluates them and synthesizes them to answer a research question. These review studies pool the results of several relevant high quality studies together to make a more reliable conclusion. Visit the following links for more information regarding systematic reviews. Moreover, it is important that you don't take peer-reviewed articles in journals as always accurate and highly high quality. Even articles published in very well-established and respected journals such as Nature have been proven to be inaccurate. The best known example of this is when a scientist, Andrew Wakefield, published a paper in The Lancet in 1998 claiming that vaccines cause autism. Critics and other researchers quickly pointed out the many flaws in Wakefield's study, even finding that he manipulated his study results. However, this falsehood was still further perpetuated to the general public by the support from the media, along with well-known celebrities such as Jenny McCarthy. It took over a decade to fully debunk this paper as completely false. To conclude, it is important to refer to the original primary research in academic papers, in addition to critically evaluating these papers, as the information the media presents may not be completely accurate. We hope this paper has aided your understanding of using evidence and research papers. Thank you for watching.